The cornetist will suddenly come forward and say, The cornetto is made of two pieces of wood carved and then joined together with a piece of leather or parchment. <laughs> Welcome back to the Re-Renaissance channel, where every month we dive into the details of a different Renaissance music topic, and we always hope to be able to tell you something you didn't already know. In this episode, we're off to sunny Renaissance Spain, where it wasn't only the local Spanish polyphony topping the charts. Franco-Flemish polyphony was also a hot topic. You know the names, Josquin, Lassus, Gombert, and one of the greatest fans of this kind of music was a man named Francisco Gomez de Sandoval. Sorry about that pronunciation there, Francisco. Apart from looking like he'd be quite at home in a deck of fantasy playing cards, Francisco also happened to be the first Duke of Lerma, and he was first minister to the king, which basically meant he had a bunch of cash at his disposal for all his favourite things. So what did he do with all the dough? Well, he created his own musical paradise at the Collegiate Church of San Pedro, where he could hire whichever musicians he wanted. Now, when you imagine chapel royal musicians who are hired to perform the polyphony of Renaissance Spain and the Netherlands, the first image to pop into your head might be singers, but not so fast. The Duke's very first musical hires were not singers, but wind players, minstrels. Because at this time, you only had real prestige if you had wind. Of course, singers were also employed throughout the year, but it was the wind players who were brought out for those big religious feasts and special occasions. I myself am only a lowly singer, so for this episode, I needed to meet with some real Renaissance minstrels. Anne, Allen, and Catherine Motus allowed me to be a fly on the wall for one of their concert planning meetings so that we can get some insights into the history, the sources, and the many, many, many instruments that go behind creating a performance fit for a duke. Hi. <laughs> I'm gonna start with like the king of instruments, the shawm. This is the soprano, the loud soprano double reed instrument. You know, from about the 14th until the 16th and even into the 17th century, this was a, a much beloved instrument because it was so loud and so impressive. And then we have the quiet sister of the shawm, the Dusain. This has been referred to as an imperfect instrument, possibly because it's, it's cylindrical, so it's just Because of that, it can only play an octave and a note. <laughs> That's all I have. But, but what an octave and a note. Absolutely. But the Poma really uh, carried on being very popular. It's also loud. And in fact, these play together really as a pair. Originally, it was a pair of these plus a slide trumpet. Then as the centuries went on, we added more and more bass, bass instruments. So we have then trombones, and then you have also like bass dulcians, and you get the bigger wind band. Compared to all these new instruments that were being developed, like the trombone and then the cornetto, shawms were beginning to, to stand out a little bit by, in comparison, the inflexibility. But the dulcians really fulfilled that role because it's still loud, it's real, I can still be very but if I wanted, I can also be a bit more uh, subtle. And I'm particularly interested in yes. this historic. It's historic. <laughs> it's historic. <laughs> this is my tuning machine. <laughs> So what exactly were the minstrels playing on all these instruments? There are two very special sources of music surviving from wind players at this time and used at Lerma.
these collections aren't arranged by composer or alphabetically by title, but rather by range and the key that the piece was in. This was a neat trick that allowed the instrumentalist to play through consecutive pieces in the book without having to switch instruments every time and with fewer worries about nasty transpositions. These manuscripts mm -hmm. are really laid out well because you have sets and sets of pieces one after another with the same ranges for every mm -hmm. um, instrument so that you know, if they're using the same transposition they, they don't they have, to have to swap. To, don't have to Just to explain to your viewers why we're transposing everything, that's a completely normal thing for winds to do. And if you don't believe me, you can take a look at um, Il Dolcimello di Aurelio Virgiliano, which is in manuscript in the Bologna Library, circa 1600, so exactly the right time. But on the bit for cornetto trombone, it shows that if your piece is written in um, normal clefs, then you can play it a tone higher, at pitch, a tone lower, or a third lower. And then on the cornetto page, he also says that if you have a normal soprano clef, C1, you can play the whole piece a fifth higher, and if you have a treble clef, a violin clef as we call it here, you can play it at pitch, whereas the singers would always transpose it down. So working out all these transpositions is just part of a wind player's job. I've learned a lot on this musical journey, but what really stands out to me is that added prestige of the wind player. Having now spent some time behind the scenes with a couple of modern Renaissance minstrels, it becomes clear to me why some of these wind players were considered superstars of their day and could even be paid much more than other chapel royal musicians such as singers or organists. After all, as a royal minstrel, it was essential to have impeccable musicianship and to really be the master of your instrument. Oh, it can be anywhere. E flat is a real note, it's not a slidey note. E, which is a D, E, F, G, A. <laughs> Don't really know for that. <laughs> Players also had to be able to perform music in many different keys and to transpose at the drop of a hat. D, 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 D. Oh, that's a D. D. Oh, no, you have to go up to E. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't... D. And it goes without saying that a job of such prestige and responsibility would only be suited to those who really took themselves and their work seriously. <laughs> With many thanks to Catherine and Anne for their time, their expertise and their humour in making this video with us, that's it from us this month on the Re-Renaissance vlog. But if you've enjoyed this video and you want to see the next one, you can like and subscribe below. Until next time, adios. So if you're interested in this repertoire, then come and see this performed live at the Historic Museum in Basel, which is on Barfusa Platz. And if you want much more information on the programme, its players, its history and booking tickets, then you can always visit the Re-Renaissance website, which will be linked in the video description. See you there.